I became a teacher and I married an archaeologist, I thought, well, gosh, we're really going to own a house. It's a poverty that you are struggling to make ends meet and not being able to pay your bills on time. Gasoline is so high, food is so high, everything is so high, expensive, and the check is the same. This is a story about Shelley, Thomas, archaeologist, and Tavish Courtney, and the house they bought. The house was on top of a mountain. The mountain was at the edge of San Diego County, and San Diego County was the place Shelley and Thomas had dreamed of owning a home. You know, my dad does title examining. My mother was a typist, but they owned a house. When I became a teacher and I married an archaeologist, I thought, well, gosh, we're really going to own a house. We saw this one driving by, and it wasn't listed yet, but it had a for sale sign. And um, I looked on that web page that it was on, and um, it looked cute. Remember how we first came here together, standing on an empty lot, holding hands. Every day, before I went to sleep, I thought to myself, I want my son to have what I had growing up, and he doesn't have it now. In 2004, Shelley and Thomas bought this one-bedroom house on Palomar Mountain for $239,000. At the time, it was one of three houses in the entire county they could find in their price range. Relieved they had bought into the market before they were priced out, they settled into what they thought would be middle-class family life. But for the Courtney's, home ownership soon became a curse. The mountain, their captor, and the commute, torture. They never foreclosed. That might have been easier. Instead, the Courtney's held onto a house that cost them thousands in car repairs, kept them in traffic for hours a day, and strained their marriage. It even kept them from their son. I really felt for a while there someone else was raising him. And not just the normal guilt I think some moms feel about going back to work, but definitely this extreme guilt because, I mean, she was literally even doing his laundry because he would have clothes there that I would never even see him in. I mean, I remember him outgrowing clothes I never even saw him in because I saw them in pajamas. The Courtney's may have only wanted what their parents had, but a new study from the San Diego Association of Government says that goal is getting more difficult to achieve. In the rest of the country, on average, each generation lives twice as well as their parents. In San Diego County, it takes two generations, or 70 years, to surpass our parents' standard of living. This old house of ours was built on dreams And a businessman don't know what that means Owning a home in San Diego never used to be this hard. Let's go back to 1970. Prices were higher in California than the rest of the country. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the median price of a house in 1970 was $17,000. In California, it was $23,000, a 35% difference. But something happened over the next several decades that saw that differential nearly double. By 2000, the median house price in San Diego County was $234,000. The national average, $147,000, a difference of 60%. The experts say blame it on two things, a Supreme Court decision in 1976 and then Proposition 13, which was passed in 1978. Together, they redistributed and limited property tax increases, taxes that until then went to cities. Along came Prop 13, mm -hmm. which here in, San, in California meant um, what we're going to do is we're going to take property, about two-thirds or more of the property tax away from local jurisdictions, and we're going to give it to uh, the state. 
Marnie Cox is an economist with the San Diego Association of Governments. He grew up in California and has been with Sandag for 30 years. He's seen our skyline expand and our county sprawl. Cox says the changes in policy discourage cities from building more houses because they diverted property taxes away from local governments. Property taxes are levied against homeowners. Those taxes used to benefit municipalities directly. But under California law, two-thirds of those taxes now go to the state and are redistributed among all school districts in California equally. When that occurred, it also affected local jurisdictions' land use decisions. Now, we're, it used to be that the major contributor of revenue through property taxes was from houses. That was no longer true. And so houses fell into disfavor. Cities in San Diego County approved fewer housing developments and the ones that were built took longer. Instead, local governments encouraged other kinds of development, things like retail, hotels, and a convention center, all of which generate more tax revenue. The impact today San Diego County is short 100,000 houses. Economists we spoke with say the law of supply and demand is the chief reason houses here cost so much more than just about anywhere else. You know, I believe the, the county line is somewhere in between the, the mountain as we know it here um, and Temecula. But San Diegans don't give up on owning a home that easily. If there aren't enough affordable houses where they live, they'll move and stay as close to the county line as they can. There was a time, and I think it's still prevalent with maybe fewer people, but there's still this concept that we can stop growth. People still believe that if you don't let that building permit out, you can stop growth. And so if you stop growth, you've been able to make sure that that new housing unit isn't needed. Well, this is an illusion. <laughs> In fact, what has happened is, is that part of the reason for urban sprawl is because you don't have enough housing units in this city, and so it's just simply moved to the next city and been created there. In San Diego, even if you don't build it, they will still come. Shelley and Thomas Courtney were willing to move up 5,500 feet and live on the edge of a mountain. There was snow. I came out and um, had no idea what to do. I was freaking out. I didn't even know if we had a shovel. Um, there was like snow past the tire. And wildlife. We had a mountain lion that lived in our backyard and so you would leave on all your lights to walk through your um, patio area to get to your car and yeah, it was really scary. It was expensive. The, the mountain eats tires, tires and brakes. So In I 2004, when the family made the move, the cost of gas was $2 a gallon. By the spring of 08, it was more than $4 a gallon. But the most difficult thing was the time away from each other. Their infant son was at the babysitters, in the car enduring a minimum 90-minute commute each way, or in daycare. When I went back to work full-time, full-time, I honestly didn't think I was going to make it. I would end up crying at work. We work, um, I work Monday through Thursday, 10 hours, and by Wednesday, I would be in tears at work and have to hide it. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> and I, can, I know my coworkers must have thought I was just like this lame, emotional mom, but literally I hadn't seen my child since Sunday. So, yeah, it's a really bad memory, <laughs> actually. The commute nearly drove them both to a breakdown. It was like six months of driving. I was on the 15 for probably three and a half hours, knowing I still have an hour once I get to Escondido. And I, I never forget, I was sitting there in the middle of traffic. Out of nowhere, I just slammed my hand down on the um, steering wheel. Ah! While the Courtney's were stuck in traffic, others were trying to get into the housing market. The subprime mortgage market was in full swing, allowing people who couldn't afford to own a house to buy one anyway. 
and San Diego was leading the way. According to DataQuick, a company that monitors real estate activity across the country, the median price in San Diego peaked in November of 2005 at $517,000. The rest of Southern California caught up in March 2007, peaking at $505,000. By then, the San Diego market was already on its way down. Murdasa Baksamusa is with the Center for Policy Initiatives in San Diego. San Diego was, especially in its peak, 2005, quite unsustainable, the, the bubble. It, in other words, the wages and the earnings were not sufficient to be able to meet the cost that was demanded by these units. Of course, you know what happened next. There's a swing outside, the kids play on every day. And tomorrow morning, a man from the bank's gonna come and take it all away. In July 1998, there were more than 2,000 foreclosures in the county. In July of this year, there were 9,500. Take it all away. That's what we need. It seems like every time I go that they're more expensive and you know, you try to keep your little preferred cards, but that still doesn't do much, you know, it's still, I mean, even diapers in the past 10 months having my son have gone up, so. <laughs> if the demise of our economy all began with housing, things only got worse when the price of gas and then food went up. Jennifer Trombley is 21 years old, a new mother, married to a 23-year-old Marine. I just, I try to just make a lot nicer meals at home, um, and then we cut a lot of coupons. Jennifer's husband makes $50,000 a year. That includes his allowance for housing. They pay more than $1,700 to live in this 900-square-foot townhouse in Tierra Santa. After utilities, gas, and food, there's little left, or sometimes, like last month, there isn't enough to last until the next paycheck. We found Trombley using a Twitter search. Twitter is another online way to chat with people. We went online and searched for Twitter chatter using the keyword money. Jennifer was talking about looking for change to buy baby food. I mean, really? Were you quite literally looking for change? Pretty much. <laughs> Back in 1970, remember before house prices escalated, a gallon of milk cost $1.15. Today it's about $3.50 a gallon. According to the USDA, all food prices have increased by 6% over last year. If it continues at that rate, it will be the highest annual increase since 1990. Things like eggs and cheese have seen double digit increases. Say, ah! Thank you. Trombley and her husband have found creative ways to stretch their shrinking dollar. He works on weekends as a mover for U-Haul and cleans houses. And to pay off credit card bills. My husband was donating plasma to pay him off. So because we were, you know, just the extra 25 bucks a month to pay that credit card off was, it was hurting us. So I think he did it somewhere around eight times. I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was good money. <laughs> According to the U.S. Census Bureau, one in ten people in the county live below the federal poverty level. That's about $10,000 a year for a single person. But most economists say the federal poverty level is an outdated and meaningless way to measure true poverty in San Diego County. Economists here double that amount, and if you use their calculations, one in four people live in economic hardship. It's almost like a person running on a treadmill and not being able to keep up with the space of the treadmill that is increasing all the time. It's increasing so fast that at some point people start falling off. Back in 1972, the average wage in the county was 30% higher than the national average. In 2005, it was only 5% higher. And now, for every one high-paying job created in the county, there are eight low-paying jobs. 
the disparity shows in our neighborhoods. Rancho Santa Fe has one of the highest family median incomes in the country at more than $196,000 a year. Drive less than 30 miles to the other side of the county and you'll be here in Barrio Logan where the median family income is $24,000. Well, the county's median household income did rise in 06, most of it went to wealthier households. The Center on Policy Initiative says nearly half of all the county's wealth went to the top one-fifth of the population. The difference we see from 10 years ago and today is that, in terms of the bottom, is that they have a lot more company. The people at the, at the bottom really uh, the issue about the shrinking middle class is that a lot of people are being squeezed into the lower class, into the lower e sectors of the economy where they're struggling to make ends meet. Add together an increasing unemployment rate, the high cost of living and too many low paying jobs and you end up here in a lineup for food. Is this just the beginning that we're seeing? If more and more middle class families are losing their jobs and continue to lose their jobs, we will see that demand increase exponentially. Chris Carter works with the San Diego Food Bank. He left a job in London, lobbying Parliament to work here. A scholarship got him to London as a teenager, but he grew up poor in Alabama with a single mother. I would save my milk it from, the, it from school lunches to give to my younger sister uh, after school when my mother came and picked us up. Uh, because she would be always cry because we didn't have enough food to feed her. Uh, I remember going hungry on weekends uh, and it's, it's so tough and it really is, it's a really hard thing to experience and I know what these people are going through because I've experienced it myself firsthand. In La Mesa, demand for food from the food bank increased by more than 100% between January and July. In Spring Valley, demand is up by 69%, in Chula Vista, 34%. And demand for this state-sponsored supplemental food plan is so high, the food bank, which helps administer the program, has been told to stop taking new clients. 67-year-old Ramona Rodriguez is a volunteer at her neighborhood community center in Logan Heights and a recipient of the supplemental food program. What's Gasoline happening? is so high, food is so high, everything is so high, expensive, and the check is the same. 73-year-old Simona Luna is at the front of the line. She receives about $800 a month on Social Security. Her rent is $500 a month. She also buys a bus pass so she can get to the hospital for her cancer treatments. Will this food last you for a month? Yes, uh-huh. A whole yes. month? Mm -hmm. Yes, because, I don't know, sometimes I eat bread, cookies like that. Uh-huh. It helps. I'm a man, I'm a woman. <laughs> for my kids, just for my kids. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You raise them on your own? Yes. Uh-huh. How many? Uh, six. So compared to that, life is good now? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. I still have that cancer, but I feel okay. With the treatment, I feel okay. Just how did this story begin with the dream of home ownership and end in poverty? We wondered that too. We found our answer in a 2008 San Diego Association of Governments prosperity study, although don't let the name fool you. Sandag looked at how we compared with 20 similar regions, places like Seattle and San Francisco. When it comes to wages, we're in the middle. Our wages have increased at an average rate compared to other cities. But our cost of living has increased faster than just about anywhere else. We're the third most expensive place to live of those 20 regions. And the biggest reason is housing. In the late 90s and through the early 2000s, San Diego families began paying as much as 50% of their gross salaries on house payments. Now when you put one over the other, we end up here, dead last, the least affordable place to live. 
While we like to think it's really the so-called sunshine tax, the beaches, the beauty, the weather that drives prices up and wages down, economists say it's a myth. We haven't built enough houses and we've created too many low-paying jobs. Ironically, jobs in the service and tourist industries, industries that can only thrive in a place this beautiful with this much sun. Let's get him! Remember Shelley, Thomas and Tavish? They moved out of their house on the mountain last year. They now live in this tiny two-bedroom apartment in Bay Park. Are you happy now? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, of course, there's some things I wish, you know, like we had a garage, but, <laughs> but yeah, we're definitely, yeah, I'm definitely happier and definitely happy. Yeah. Without a doubt, I read my kid a bedtime story every night and we have dinner together every night. The Courtney's never foreclosed. They never even sold. They couldn't. The market crashed. They continued to pay their rent and their mortgage, barely getting by with the help of some renters who pay a nominal amount to live in their old house. But Thomas, he can't seem to let the dream go. He still comes up here and works on the property. He's a volunteer firefighter and even saved his house from burning down in the wildfires last year, a month after his family had moved out. You saved the house that really was ruining your lives, your family life, from burning down. They could have burned down. You would have been free. You wouldn't have owned any money. No. You would have been free of all this. Oh, no. Not free of my work and our memories. And, there, and even though there were... There was a lot of hard times. We had a lot of nice memories here. We went sledding down over there, and I saw a mountain lion right there. Tavish and I watched Charger games over there, and this is his third birthday tree and his fourth birthday tree and his first birthday tree. We took walks. We, we, there were things to enjoy about the house. Um, and the other thing is, is that this home is a beautiful home. It's a wonderful place to live. The man who built this home lived in it his entire life with his wife. Um, they had a beautiful life here. Somebody is going to enjoy this home someday. Take it all away.